the second one goes to school and he fails. He literally fails. He stares into space. He wets his pants daily and he bites his fingernails. And what do you do as a parent in that situation? I had a two-year-old at home, so I didn't feel I could withdraw him from school. I met with the teacher on day six of school and she threw up her hands and said, well, I don't know how I'm going to teach him this year. You know, he's so far behind, he just stares into space most of the day. And what was not recognised then, and this was back in 1994, was that a child staring into space is not a defiant child. That's an overwhelmed child. And he, had, he can't do anything. And children don't have the language to say, I'm afraid. I can't do what the teacher's asking. I can't hear anything. I'm just scared. And when the brain is scared, the brain shuts down. My son's brain shut down. Hi, everyone. Welcome to one more episode of Pinky J Podcast. Today, I'm super excited to have a guest here. Her name is Lois Letchford. She is an author, a teacher, and has an incredible journey. So hi, Lois. How are you? Hello, Pinky. I'm delighted to be here. Super excited to talk about your journey and your traumas. Um, so I know women struggle a lot throughout their whole life, right? Like we, it's never easy for us. So I want to touch base on your story and understand your experience. It's a long story. <laughs> It's a long story and I just identify with the struggles that women face. I don't know, something in our DNA that when we have children, the struggle just amplifies or the, the need to care for our children. That's fundamental to us. And we think, you know, kids are okay, we'll be fine. And then I have three sons. The first one goes to school and he learns at the speed of light. The second one goes to school and he fails. He literally fails. He stares into space. He wets his pants daily and he bites his fingernails. And what do you do as a parent in that situation? I had a two-year-old at home, so I didn't feel I could withdraw him from school. I met with the teacher on day six of school and she threw up her hands and said, well, I don't know how I'm going to teach him this year. You know, he's so far behind, he just stares into space most of the day. And what was not recognised then, and this was back in 1994, was that a child staring into space is not a defiant child. That's an overwhelmed child. And he, had, he can't do anything. And children don't have the language to say, I'm afraid. I can't do what the teacher's asking. I can't hear anything. I'm just scared. And when the brain is scared, the brain shuts down. My son's brain shut down. Wow. And how old was he? Six. So and at the end of the year, he's six and a half. They test him. The testing reveals he's got no strengths. He can read 10 words and he's got a low IQ. Wow. For a six-year-old. For a six-year-old. And any child in that basket, it's a basket that's got very long sides and very long slippery sides and the chances of them getting out are almost non-existent. And this is where my story becomes different. The following year, my husband, who is a professor, had study leave in Oxford, England. And that was where he did his PhD. And we had the opportunity to remove Nicholas from school and take him away. We did it. I go prepared a series of books called Success to All, and they were a total failure. Wow. <laughs> so I failed again, and my mother-in-law was with me. She heard me getting frustrated, and she said to me, Lois, put away what is not working and make learning fun. And her words allowed me to relax and forget what you've been taught, start with a blank slate and go for it. And I thought, what can Nicholas do? Well, he can rhyme words and he can see patterns. And that's where I work from. So I wrote this one little poem about a mug of a bug, a silly, silly thing. And he relaxed. He loved it. He laughed through it. We read it again and again and again. And he illustrated it. And because that worked, I did another and another and another. Poems became important. One lady spoke to me when I was in Oxford, and this is another problem of challenging challenges you face, that who speaks to you and who you connect with is 
luck of the gods. And she gave me the book for decoding that really helped Nicholas hear it, see it, say it, do it. And it taught me as much as it taught Nicholas. And the poetry kept getting getting better. And we're doing this, you know, an hour a day, three quarters an hour a day on decoding. But it was the poetry that was transformative because the double O's come up and the O's are in Cook, Look and Book. Okay. And I wrote a poem about Captain James Cook, the last of the great explorers. And as we read it again and again and again, Nicholas said to me, can I see Captain Cook's original maps? And the first thing that I thought was, that's not a question that comes from a child with a low IQ. And then he said to me, who came before Captain Cook? Oh, that's easy, Nicholas, says Smarty Pants' mother. That was Christopher Columbus. And he says to me, and who came before Columbus? And I am blown away because I had no clue who came before Columbus because my history didn't go back that far. <laughs> and what I had to do was I had to do the research to find out who came before Columbus and what happened and, and the steps in between Columbus and, and, the, and the rest of the world and the world mapping. And then... I had to take that information and put it into a poem because if I didn't put it into a poem, I would lose Nicholas. And the poetry format, you know, the simple words, the rhyming words, the rhythm allowed him to go. And poetry then allows you to talk and explore. And that's what we did together. That's interesting because not the teachers didn't know what to do and not every parent would have your patience and be able to be that creative to start teaching their son or daughter. And I had my in-laws staying with us. So we had, you know, the younger son was going to kindergarten, the eldest son was in school, and Nicholas needed one-on-one -on -one uninterrupted time with me. And if he didn't have that, he just gave up and he quit mm -hmm. seemingly quickly. But that wasn't the case. You know, he just worked so hard and learning was so hard for him. And what I didn't acknowledge for a long time, Nicholas actually has um, hearing disability and he had ear infections from the age of 8 to 18 months. Ear infections impact the brain and the brain learning. So parents with children with ear infections, it doesn't take much to create a learning disability. But Nicholas's learning disability was severe and he ends up being on the second percentile of hearing and learning and language two oh, out of a hundred yeah that's so interesting you say that because my nephew is actually struggling a lot with um ear infections so they were finally able to go to the doctor and he's getting the tubes in but we were a little worried because it affects the brain yeah yeah, yeah. and and when we send children to school we all expect them to learn all at the same rate we expect them to be at the same position of oral language and comprehension of oral language and that's a problem and I don't know how autism comes into the play with this either but that I don't understand what happens but I know the result and okay so we return to Australia I see the person who had done the testing the year before and I say to her Nicholas has asked these amazing questions she stood in front of me and she said well I've spoken to the reading teacher and he's gone backwards and in fact He's the worst child I've seen in 20 years of teaching. She said that? She said Wow. She said that. You don't say that about a kid. But did she know about his learning disability? He and had a low IQ. He had a low IQ, doesn't he? That's, wow. I'm so speechless. Like, oh my. <laughs> it's what makes me passionate because this is the part of the story that I really want to tell. That very afternoon, the reading teacher sends Nicholas home with Two sentences to learn the word saw, S-A-W. The first sentence is, I saw a cat climb up a tree. And the second sentence is even better. I saw a man rob a bank. Okay. <laughs> and Nicholas stands, stands at the door and he reads, I saw a cat and he stopped. I was a cat. No, no. I asked a cat and I asked a cat. And then he just hands me the paper. And it took me a while to work out what was happening. Nicholas has the concrete meaning of the word saw. He's cutting the cat in half and he knows you don't do that. He's in all of that reading, he's searching for meaning. What's the teacher done? The teacher has only provided the abstract meaning of the word saw. So we've got this huge gap between what the child is seeing 
what the teacher is seeing and the teacher is saying, well, the kid's dumb, that's why he can't learn, as opposed to the one thing that you can say is what do I have to do as a teacher to get this kid to read? That's all she had to do. And that's what drove me. I went back to school to become a reading specialist and I found this paper, academic paper, that was in our reading and it's called Beyond the Deficit Theory, written by an Australian professor called Brian Camborn. And in that paper, he says, when children fail to learn to read, we blame the child. We say, look at their background. Look at this. Look at that. This is why they're not learning. Instead of looking at how we're teaching, I live the academic literature. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, it's true because I think children are, there's there's so much competition in schools or like everyone's, you have to learn how to read at a certain age. You have to learn how to do this at a certain age. And, you know, kids with disability, unfortunately, are not able to do it through the pressure of society. So how as parents and as teachers, can we help these kids out? And you did great doing that. And from there, you know, when I work with students, my goal is always to think what is going on in their mind and what do I have to do to get these words into them in a way that they learn. And, and learning, we say learning for fun, should, that does, shouldn't matter. It's actually fundamental because it changes the brain. When we're stressing children with learning, they're not doing it. They're in a panic mode. Nothing's going in. There's nothing going into memory. So we've got to do things in a way that the child can learn. And to do that, it's got to be child-centered. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what parents and teachers to start doing now versus, you know, telling their kids, oh, you're dumb because you don't know how to read versus, hey, like, let's start teaching in a different way and helping you. Yeah. Culture becomes a huge part of learning. When you go to school, the curriculum is mainly white. It's female. And what's the third thing I say? I've forgotten. <laughs> it's white, it's female, and it's middle class. That, just like I saw a cat alienated Nicholas, that curriculum alienates many minorities. You know, when Nicholas had been in Oxford, he'd been in another country, the teacher could not change her teaching to say, Nicholas, tell me what you saw when you were away last year. I mean, that blows my mind. And it's no different when our children come with a slightly different background, that we have to just engage them. What's their home life like? Use that as the start of the teaching. It's not me with the right. It's what the kid knows. And as you said, Nicholas is five and a half when he got into trouble. Our children are so young at the absolute beginning of their lives. Write about your home life, their home life. Engage the parents, the grandparents, the extended family, and just show them how important that they are and their family is. And the words they use in the home are. Because when you start looking at language and look at a word like saw, I saw saw is, you know, the concrete meaning is to, is the, the saw, the saw itself. The mm -hmm. second is cut and the third is to look. And when you look at language development of the word saw, you've got to say, is the word saw in the child's oral language? Or does the child say, I've seen it or I haven't, or they're still at that point that says, I seed it, where you're taking the S-E-E -E and adding an E-D to it like you normally do, like in Walked and Talked. Mm -hmm. So you've got to start questioning more. And then when you do this, this word saw, the way I teach is really quite simple. I get my kids onto the internet and I say, type in the word saw. Now they've got a picture. Their picture and my picture is the same. Take one of these pictures, cut and paste it, put it into a Word document. We're going to print it out. That's your saw. Now we're going to look at the verb, meaning to cut, Another cultural component is, do you saw it, do you chop it? Is that mm. what's in the child's language and in the child's home life? And then the third thing I do is I take a pencil and paper and I walk around the school and we go, I usually start in the library and we watch the librarian and we talk to them and chat. Then we walk out of the room and shut the door and I say to my students, what did we do? 
we saw the librarian reading to the children. We saw the librarian doing this, that, and that. When is it happening? Is it happening now or in the past? Oh, it's happening now. Is it happening now? No, no, no. In the past, it's happening. Ah, they say. Now they're reading, they're writing, they're connecting, they're making meaning. I've got it. Wow. I love this technique and I love the way you teach. You have such a passion and I think teachers out there have to be more like you, honestly, because you have that passion and that drive to actually teach these students versus just be like, here's here's the curriculum, figure it out. And if you pass, you pass. If you fail, you know what, you stay back. You know, I'll tell you something. Now, I've been doing this now for 30 years. A mother whose 16-year-old child came to me in tears, child's not reading, four years in a dis- school for dyslexic children. Mm-hmm non-reading the very first thing i do is get the mother to write the word to on a piece of paper to and i get the kids and i say you've read the word give me a sentence with that word and he said what did he say now i've got i've got two hands Mm. that concrete versus abstract if you're 16 years old and you're non-reading and you haven't got to and two forget the rest F-O-R, he says to me, I've got four grey shark's teeth. Why can't this child read? Because every time he comes to that point, it's going, nothing's making sense. Mm-hmm. And once you get through that and work out that, you know, he's seeing everything he's seeing is concrete, he can't see the abstract, and he's reading words without pictures. That's why he's not making sense of reading. And one of the poems I gave him was... Um, a grouchy kangaroo and it's about this kangaroo who collects rushes and grooming needs in her pouch and because the zipper doesn't work properly (laughs) and to teach him this and using all these my grooming needs and my lipstick and my tail brush I had the mother collect all of her cosmetics now when you come to grooming needs what are we looking at are you using a brush and a comb or is it grooming so the words, words mean something. Mm-hmm. And he read this and then, then he starts giggling and laughing. And, and if there was a problem in the poem, what's stopping him from remembering that? And that was my thinking. Ah, we've got to do something about this. And he, in the end, just loved that poem. His name is Matthew and it's on my YouTube channel. If you want to listen to him, read The Grouchy Kangaroo. It's hilarious it's turning the learners around from i hate this this is stupid to this makes sense this is meaningful this is a value exactly and everyone learns differently (laughs) (laughs) yes you're right everyone does learn differently however the best readers make the jumps at such speed we fail to see them happening and Mm -hmm. it's it's to and two there's foundational components to reading that every single child must make and like that this we just ignore them we ignore them or we don't recognize that they make such a problem and because i've specialized in the child at the bottom every child makes these jumps and i recognize where the problems lie right when i have a child i'm coming to you Well, you might have a problem. And you never know. I'm coming to you. Well, you know, it's such a difficult journey. My heart just broke in 19... You know, I could see my little boy working so hard and I'm seeing the growth in, in snail millimetres, not centimetres, millimetres, so, so small. And yet I could see his thinking exploding. And that was exciting, but the growth through school was still just minimal and it took him a long time. And, okay, I'll share about my book because the movement from Australia to Texas in 19 was unbelievable and changed Nicholas's life again. In Australia, Nicholas was considered the slow child who's done really well. He's reading, he's writing, he's in fifth grade reading on a second, third grade reading level, but he's done really well. He's reading, isn't he? The move to Texas changed his outcome and he went from the bottom of the class to the top. He graduated in the top 20% of the high school class. Wow, look at him. That's amazing. And put him on the trajectory 
to, he completed two undergraduate degrees, one in engineering and one in mathematics, two honours degrees. And do you know the final bit of the story? No, what's the final? He got his PhD in applied mathematics from Oxford University, UK. Wow. Look at him. From being the slow, dumb, IQ child to PhD. He did amazing. And it and you did amazing. I learned so much from him, so much. His drive to learn, his drive to succeed is unbelievable. But, you know, the steps, once he was reading in my book, there are steps that any parent can take for their child who is behind to okay. have them listen to audio books because they have to hear the language. It's got to be in there orally before it will come out in the written language. Just like the word saw to seed or I sawed it or I seed it, what are they saying? And if the one thing as a parent, what you can do is spend time talking to your child. Reading, why is reading so important? Because the, when we speak, we actually only use a really small number of words. When we talk and when we read, oh, sorry, not when we talk, when we read and read poetry and books, the language widens. And mm -hmm. the widest, biggest range of language is in children's books so reading children's books yes yeah and the the picture books the language mm -hmm. in picture books is amazing join the library i don't buy books when my children start getting to age three four and five because you can't keep up with them but the libraries use the libraries mm -hmm. and question about uh texas like you said that he jumped was it the the schooling, was it the teacher, was it the educational system? What exactly like made him be able to? It was mindset. Okay. He's not the slowest kid in the class who's just behind. He's just a kid who's behind. Mm -hmm. and, and some extraordinary things happened to Nicholas. And the first was that he repeated for a second time. He went against the grain. He repeated fourth grade. And the gap between his learning and the classroom learning was shrunk. And that was critical. And he took away more from the classroom. The goal of special education and reading should always be to have the child learn more in the classroom. And if they're not, we have to ask why and what we can do to help them be successful in the classroom. And that was the big thing. Because once you're learning at the rate of your peers, which Nicholas did, he started to fly. And the second thing that happened, do you know where Lubbock, Texas is? No. No, don't worry. But it's <laughs> thousands, of, and not thousands, it's hundreds of miles from everywhere else. It's a six-hour drive between Lubbock and Dallas and between Lubbock and Santa Fe. Driving, driving, driving. And I said to the librarian, what do I do? The kids fight in the car. She said, listen to audio books. We listen to audio books. And Nicholas is the one saying, what are we listening to this time? What are we listening to this time? And you, that's where you're getting the hearing of the language. And you're not listening to it once. He's listening to it two and three times. And he just loved the books. And that was a carryover into the classroom and to general learning and helping him grow. When children are behind, they have to do the work to catch up. We can, and it's like providing a dinner plate. We have to provide them with the tools that they can use to grow. Audio books is a huge one. Interesting. Okay. Wow. I'm so happy for Nicholas. Yes. It's a double-edged sword for me because, yes, Nicholas did incredibly well. It should never belong to privilege. And that's where I start to get really emotional and really upset because the extreme privilege we had, I couldn't afford to tutor him, pay someone to tutor him. And I wouldn't have trusted them because Nicholas would have sat back. And then they would have blamed Nicholas again. So it's a really difficult balance. How do you find it? I was a stay-at-home mum at the time. And I would spend all day thinking, what activity? How am I going to teach him X, Y, and Z tonight? What do I have to have ready for him? And a lot of that material is what I now use for my students because wow. it's time to think about it. And it's, I feel for mothers, I feel for young families who've got children who are struggling and both parents are required to work. And I don't know how you navigate this field anymore because my trust in the system, my trust in the system is very small. And that's sad because oh, we, should, we should trust the system. Yeah. 
But, you know, the lady I'm talking about, 16-year-old mother, $100,000 they spent on their child to have him come out non-reading. Wow. Yeah, I think parents should start being a little bit more educated on how to educate their 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 child with learning disabilities or in general, not just with learning disabilities, just in general mm -hmm. versus just be like, hey, you just go to school and they'll teach you. Because I think education comes from the home first. Yes. And what value you place on education and reading and your parent, you as a parent, model. You do a lot of modeling that becomes unconscious to the child. Are you reading a book yourself? So do they see you valuing this or what do they see you doing? Do they see you reciting poetry? Do they see you reading culturally appropriate literature from your culture? Or are you reading something else? Or are you reading something else and expecting them to do the normal? Right, because they're right. essentially them. like their role, their role model. Yes, yes, yes. And I would encourage parents to write for their children. You know, even if it's a journal, it doesn't have to be published in, in any way. But to value your culture, to value your your experience and to put that in writing and have the child value your culture is a critical part of growing and learning in education. I am sure it's going to inspire so many parents, women, even children who are listening out there. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Because there's a little video clip. It's a two under two minute video clip of Nicholas going from the bottom to the top and it's it's incredibly moving so Great. look at that watch that and buy my book and connect with me that's what I would say connect with me and let's have some fun and some games and enjoy learning yes please connect um, and buy the book absolutely you just seem like an incredible teacher so I, I will reach out to you one day when I have my children and I'm struggling is there um, any before you wrap up is there anything you want to tell parents or women struggling to the listeners it's a mindset when your child is struggling tell them they are future rocket scientists <laughs> and encourage them to know and to believe in themselves you have to believe in them but they believe in themselves as well and then the, they must learn to read and learn to read in a way that engages and encourages. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being on here. And I, I love that your story is just incredible. And I'm super happy for Nicholas and how far he's gotten. Thank you, Pinky. So are we.